Okay, right, I'll start sharing my screen. Share screen. And I'll share the whole screen. Cool, right. Uh, so thumbs up if you can see the screen. Yep. Yeah, I can see it. Ah, uh, fab. All right, cool. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run for similar to the format before, I'll run through the um, presentation uh, first that'll give us an overview. And then if you want, we can step through the code. Um, and if we want to spin off from there, we can try applying it to a different data set um, or just run it from one of the example data sets. Um, either way, we'll learn something from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll click into presentation mode. that down, uh, change it to there. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll just hide everything because we know who's talking. Okay, um, like we've got um, the concept for today we're gonna deal with is something called semantic segmentation and the tool that we're gonna manipulate um, the data with um, is uh, UNET um, on FastAI. So, um, it's a lot of the stuff if you've seen previous fast AI ones uh, is going to seem fairly logical. Um, it's just a little bit um, different in terms of what what you're trying to achieve from the uh, simple classification examples we've been doing up till now. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over what um, object de detection is and explain the differences between that and segmentation. And then we'll look at what segmentation is used for. Um, then I'll give you a brief overview of what UNET is and how it works. And then I'll um, bust into how it, it works actually in practice in um, Fast AI. I'm just going to check in case we're missing anyone. Yeah, just checking that I haven't uh, missed anyone else. I think it gives me notifications if um, anybody turns up. Okay, so um, that's basically what we're going to go through. Um, object detection, what segmentation is, how it differs, and then unit and unit and that's the eye. Okay, so object detection, you've probably seen this before. It's um, Generally what it does is it takes an input image and then it has a selection of items that you would normally sort of classify on and then it runs a classifier over the image and it puts generally uh, the output is a bounding box around what it thinks is an object and it gives you um, the uh, quality of the um, prediction so it gives you what it thinks the confidence level is so generally what will happen is um, You'll, you'll run the um, the model and it will, um, if you're using like um, region um, CNN or fast RC CNN or RCCN faster, um, what they'll do is they, um, they actually um, run the initial pass recurrently over the, uh, the image. And then what it does is it, um, Use a support vector machine um, to uh, confidence levels, um, and then it basically says which ones are worth um, classifying, and then that's where you get your output. Um, YOLO is actually a wee bit smarter than that. It stands for you only look once, and it parses the entire um, image in one single pass, um, and it basically has a whole bunch of different boxes and does a prediction for each box. And then um, similar to the way that we were masking the um, predictions uh, for the multi-label, what you do is you give it a confidence level and everything above a certain confidence level, it will show. And then what you do is you, you just uh, filter it for overlaps because you don't want like um, 12 bounding boxes around a single car so if they if they overlap you generally um remove all but the most confident one yolo is a network or 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 it's just like uh it's just like how it would filter the convolution layer like with c pixels and pixels 
uh, sorry, the I, I didn't quite make out what the question was. So I was asking, like, as as you mentioned, like this RCNN and fast RCNN, and you say YOLO, and you're saying like YOLO decides like whether the object is in the image. So is it like some 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 network in itself, some algorithm in itself, or is it just like simply we are we are putting like how 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 we put filters over the image uh, in the convolution layer. So just check what pixels are there and then just figure out whether this filter is there on the image or not. Mm -hmm. Well, well, um, Yolo's um, Yolo is very similar to um, a normal um, convolutional neural network. Um, the RCNNs um, they work on a slightly different basis. Um, if you actually, if you want to dig into it a bit deeper, I've got um, a link here to a slide back that I did on um, object detection. Um, I was really just wanting to, at this stage, um, show you what object de uh, detection looks like. Uh, so. Um, Maybe dive into um, object detection once we've gone through this, or we could have a little segue into it just now if you want. Sorry, say again. Oh, I was just saying we could potentially have a look at um, object detection in a bit more detail um, when we get to the end. Um, go, go on with the presentation, I'll take it later. That's fine. Cool. I'll share the link to the um, slideshow. Yeah, yeah, no worries. So um, I'll move on to semantic segmentation now and how it's different. So it's basically the big difference is it's much more fine grained. And what it does is it applies a classifier to each pixel in the image. So it, it's not looking for um, objects within the image. It's trying to define which object each pixel is. Um, so it's useful for things like um, describing the outline of an object. Um, one of the areas this is really popular for is um, mapping. So if you take like a satellite image, um, you can then generate um, uh, less um, dense and more useful information from it. Um, so you can define like road structures, um, building structures, level of industrialization, um, uh, detect things like airports and stuff like that. And uh, when I was looking for examples, uh, there's a lot of people using it to detect horses. Uh, maybe they just like the look of them. Um, so there's some really good uh, uh, segmentation data sets. Um, similar to most of the deep learning um, problems, you really need a, a fair number of uh, images to, that have the contextual information already defined. Uh, this is actually quite a laborious task to do, and there are some some good tools to help you out. Um, but what the what the uh, human user effectively has to do is take the input image and then um, basically paint it with the different uh, uh, classifications that you want. So in this example, um, the CAMVID data set, um, they um, they went around and uh, marked everything with. Uh, a color based on whether it's a road, a tree, housing, uh, cars, uh, road markings, uh, sky. So the, you can see how that would be quite a onerous task. Uh, the CAMVED one was one of the early ones and it's a good one to work with because it's not too huge and you can get quite reasonable results from it. Uh, it's um, one of the local councils um, produced the data and it was uh, it's quite good for the UK because it's got the UK road markings on it and um, it's overcast, which is uh, your normal use case. Um, the COCO data set is the... Uh, do they, uh, uh, the segmentation, do they color it frame by frame? Yes, on each every, frame every... Needs, yeah, each frame needs to be manually uh, uh, done. Uh, some of the um, tools that they use, um, they automate it a little bit. So um, if it's a, a frame one after the other, it, they all um, the the mask will stay the same, and then you just adjust the bits that are needing change. The difference, yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, labor so, intensive task that if it's a long video or uh, lots of frames in it. Yeah, so this is the thing. It's, you generally don't you don't take um, you wouldn't probably do every frame because there wouldn't be a lot of meaningful information from that. You'd maybe take like uh, one frame a second or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Coco's, uh, that's Common Objects in Context, I think it stands for. That's a, another good one. Uh, that's uh, got a genuinely large amount of um, images in it. Um, 
2.5 million of them um, and they're labeled sorry 2.5 million labeled instances in 328k images so you've got a nice big data set there to work with and um, Fast AI's um, done a little subset of it, though. Um, it's a bit more manageable. Um, so it's only got the chair, couch, TV, remote, and bays in it. Um, so <laughs> yeah, for us testing during the lockdown, that's probably all, <laughs> all our camera's likely to see. Um, um, of course, Fast AI has um, some data sets that you can use. Let's see what happens if I click that. Um, you can see here the it's got the Camved data set, uh, Pascal data set, and then it's got um, Coco. So it's got a good um, selection of them. Let's jump back here. Go back into the deck. Where did you press Echo? Oh, ah, we'll just look at it like this. Uh, so other applications you can use segmentation for. Um, one of the um, uh, good examples in Kaggle is the iMaterialist fashion data set. And what that's doing is it's taking fashion photographs and trying to define what type of garment is. So you can see this um, dapper fellow with his, uh, his fancy little um, shirt and jacket. Uh, and you can see there that somebody's produced a, a nicely segmented image uh, to even uh, call out like to watch. So um, you can see here the output I got from training Fast AI. Um, I think it was, I'm trying to remember what I used. I think it was, uh, actually, I think it was exactly the same model as, as I'm about to show you. I think it was UNet for this as well. Uh, you can see the um, values on the left there, the, um, the ground truth and the predictions. And other than the bottom image, it's done really, really quite well. So you can see, unfortunately for that lady, it's quite, it's not done a great job at identifying her shorts, but the clear images of the, the pants and the t-shirt has done um, almost pixel perfect um, representation of what the uh, ground truth was. Uh, you remember this is just a single uh, bit one cycle, so only ran once. Uh, it did take 50 minutes though. Okay, so what's UNET? Um, so UNET was originally used for medical imaging. So that's things like if you've got a slide um, or a mammary um, photograph, um, and what they're doing is they're trying to identify things like cysts and um, uh, cancerous tissue and things like that. So what they're, they're what they were doing was um, highlighting the areas that the technicians um, should pay most attention to. Um, but what they actually found is that the, this model was uh, applicable to almost all segmentation problems. Uh, the, you can see here what the original um, UNET was, and it's really quite small. Um, it didn't have an awful lot of complicated steps in it. Um, you can see here it's only it's doing three by three convolutions um, with uh, ReLU um, to do the nonlinearity and um, some max pooling and some upcom uh, two by two. So there. But none of this is, is particularly complicated stuff. Uh, but the, the, the bit of genius to it is the, the idea of taking your input file, processing it the same way as you would do to produce like a classification, skipping the classification part of the, the, the network, and then do the reverse, almost mirror um, on the right-hand side of it. And what that does is it then goes through the process of upscaling. Uh, so what really, really benefits us is that we've already got some great classifiers that can do the left-hand side of it. Um, so um, when we're training, we only really need to figure out the right-hand side of it um, for doing the upsampling side or the what they call the encoder um, and decoder parts of the, the network. So if you see this side, this will look very, the left-hand side will look very similar to what um, like uh, ResNet um, would look like for doing image classification. So when fast AI to do segmentation, you uh, need a function to define the mask. Um, so that's generally going to be using an input file. Uh, so you create a small lambda function um, and uh, create a new mask um, object using the open mask, which you pass then uh, the function that you've created. The um, 
like everything in fast AI, they've got some nice ways to visualize. Um, so if you do mask.show, uh, it'll give you a, a view of what the mask looks like. Um, then you use that mask in your um, data bunch constructor. And you can see here that um, they, when we run show batch, um, it's even smart enough to overlay the original image with the mask. So you can see what, what parts of the original image are getting masked, um, sorry, are getting uh, picked out as specific um, subtypes. So here you can see that the trees have all been um, masked in green, uh, the sidewalks are uh, purple, the people are this sort of darker purple, and the buildings are this orange. Uh, so you can see, uh, again, very, very little of this is going to be new. Um, you've got the label from function where you pass your function in and your normalization is exactly the same um, because you're using um, ResNet. Um, you're going to be using the ImageNet stats again. Uh, again, don't think too much about it. You can take the defaults, but things like um, transform Y um, being true allows it to mirror the images. Um, so yeah, none, none of this um, should be overly complicated. And then you construct your learner. Um, and as you can see, um, you're using models.resnet34 again. Now that might, st I mean, that's, I've got to admit this, when I first saw it, it struck me as really odd. Um, ResNet is not a unit. Uh, unit is a completely different thing. Uh, but fast AI is smarter than me. And uh, the same way that when we do our transfer learning, um, if you remember, we'll take the, the rest of the smartly trained uh, network we break off the last fully connected layer and the softmax part of it that does the classification, and we replace those final two really simple layers with our own um, versions of them to get our own classifications. And we use all that juicy um, smart intelligence um, to apply it to our specific problem. Now, when Fast AI looks at UNET, what it does is it does that exact same step chucks away the final fully connected layer and softmax, and then it mirrors it. So completely gives you the complete inverse of it and generates the right-hand side of it, I think with randomized um, weights and biases. So when you do your um, transfer learning and you start your training, this is where it, it varies a little bit from before. When we were doing the um, training before, what it would do is it would train the final layers when you were frozen. And then when you unfroze, it would um, train the already allocated ones that you've taken from um, the original model. In this one, when you have frozen and unfrozen, what happens when you're frozen, uh, the entirety of the original ResNet model is maintained. And the only thing that's trained is the newly created layers on the right hand side. So the encoder stays exactly the same and only the decoder part um, starts getting trained. When you turn off um, the frozen, what happens is then it allows it to train the entire network. Um, so again, what you would do is you get a pretty good result. And then only when you're doing fine tuning, would you allow it to modify the, um, the input encoder side. And Again, this is one of the things I love about Fast AI. All of this does, uh, all this stuff is done automatically. Uh, awesome. Okay, um, tips and tricks. Um, so uh, batch sizes need to be small, as effectively you're running a classifier on every single pixel. That's using an awful lot of memory. Um, the concept of progressive upscaling is very efficient on this. That's where you train on smaller image sizes and then uh, you transfer learn onto the higher resolution. Um, if you scale or transform your images, you also need to remember to scale your masks. Um, this is one of the things that came up in the MOOC. Uh, some cases um, switching to mixed precision, so turning on um, FP16 can actually help with um, both accuracy and memory consumption. And according to um, Gilbert, um, we, and this is, this is actually the reason why I'm calling this out is I couldn't actually find any documentation um, to support the things, uh, so the encoder being frozen. Uh, and it was only actually um, Gilbert Danner's um, blog 
um, that gave me the information about um, how the decoder side um, trains. Uh, um, I, I would take that a little bit with a pinch of salt. This is a nice little tool um, project. Um, if you remember what I was saying, how it's, uh, it's kind of difficult to paint the images. And what this one's doing is it's doing a bit of quite smart um, boundary and edge detection. And it allows you to create your data sets quite easily. There's a, a, this, is, um, this little animated GIF is showing you how a end user would, would do it. Uh, so you can see how it, the first pass um, is fairly accurately defining the road and the forest. Uh, and then what happens is once it does the original first pass, he realizes these little sections haven't been colored in correctly. So roughly um, map, uh, roughly selects them and then runs the process again. And it, it gets you a pretty well masked image um, to, to work uh, in your data set, which is kind of cool. So bump back to here. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Yeah, um, if you want to get this um, done professionally, um, this is the link to course.fastai um, and about 30 minutes into lesson three is where uh, Jeremy covers all this. So that's, um, that's it for the boring presentation. Uh, just have a look at it actually working. Or um, actually what I'll do is I'll bounce the questions for a bit um, and then we can decide what we want to do. Can't believe there's no questions after all that. Okay, uh, I was quite surprised at the tool, though, the pixel annotation tool. Like, it, uh, I'll be surprised if like it works for complicated things because it has just forest and road. But what if they are like, if if we are annotating dogs and humans and and cars and trees and houses and street lights, then how good is it? Mm -hmm. that? It's probably, good. I'm definitely going to download it and have a proper play with it. Um, but yeah, the, the, it does seem to be working for, I, I think it's basically working on edge detection. Mm -hmm. uh, so for, for these, uh, this classic image, it's done fairly well. You, you don't, it, we don't know exactly how much work went into doing that though. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, does does it do the uh, thing on uh, images or is it on video as well? Well, um, because you um, the data the input to this um, won't be a video. What you would do is you would take specific frames out of a uh, similar to the way you do most um, uh, video classification. You don't do video classification. You you take an image. Um, so if you can do say seven inferences a second you you would you would take seven images per second you, you, would, no, you, wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't take sorry, the full 24. No well, my question was like if, if you've got a, uh, sorry a whole video and everything you just put that video in it or you just uh, take the frames out of the video first and then put those frames or those images in this and then run it. Uh, what you would do is you would grab the um, screen, grab, uh, sorry, you would grab, grab the, the frames images and everything. And, yeah, then, yeah, okay. and then, then, then process the images. And, and, then, and then process the images, okay. Yeah. I was wondering if you, if you could put an image, the whole video in it, and then uh, uh, make segments of the frame, and then you do it on there. No. I mean, no. As, as uh, I said at the beginning, the, the, the process for doing this is fairly laborious. Um, that's why. Yeah, the, the, it's much better than the manual pixeling, uh, doing it manually. Using the um, the using the existing data sets is definitely the way forward, mm -hmm. unless you've got a very specific um, task. Yeah, and most of the time, what, what people are doing is they're um, they're identifying things that are classes of problems that people have already solved. So. Um, using something that's been trained to detect ships at sea, um, or using ones that have been detecting like Amazonian deforestation, um, mm -hmm. they are ones that have been trained to deal with um, satellite and mapping data. Um, so that they probably be the good ones for you to transfer or learn off of. Um, and then there's a lot of um, self-driving car um, work that's been done. Yeah. So those um, mm -hmm. data sets are really good for building things like um, 
uh, robots or people detectors or uh, any of those sort of um, tasks. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, well, um, what, what do you guys want to do? Um, we could either just dive through um, the notebook. Um, I can uh, maybe pull it onto Colab or something and uh, try and run it. The difficulty with doing this is, is you can see uh, if we scroll down to the first epoch of training, uh, yeah, it's a, it's one of these ones where you're better off kicking it off and then coming back. Um, <laughs> uh, if, Go for a lunch break or something like that. Yeah, this, come back. this was with a GPU. <laughs> <laughs> and, and part of the problem um, is uh, if you go back, um, if you scroll back, uh, you can see here um, batch size. Um, we're only talking about processing eight or four images at a time. Um, whereas when we were processing like the food data sets, um, yeah, I mean, you could throw like 200 of them in at a time. Hmm. True. So it always, I mean, that's the thing as well, is it scales based on the size of input image. Uh, it generally it might be worth asking Vishal, uh, he's been using, I think, Colab Pro, he said. So uh, might be. Uh, I don't think it will help. Even like if it's Colab Pro, he... The, the numbers he is giving, I don't think it will make a big difference because um, uh, when you go from K8 to P100 graphic card, you see some jump, but but it's still not that big. Yeah, uh, when I was running this, I, I was running on a Volta 100, so <laughs> there, so there was the fastest uh, even at the time. <laughs> yeah, with Colab Pro. So I don't think, but but I think it's the same RAM though for P hundred and V hundred. The sixteen GB is the uh, flops, which are more in V one hundred, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, I think the P one hundred is meant to be the. It's like a um, a cheaper um, version than the the V one hundred. I think it was just because it was designed in two thousand sixteen. V one hundred come came later, so I think that's the only chance to be. be on things they improved on the number of uh, threads they can compute at the same time. All right. So yeah, uh, I don't think, yeah, as you said, then we can go through the code then. Uh, uh, either we can go through the notebook if you have the outputs in the notebook. So we can just scroll through your outputs and see what's happening in each cell. Yeah, uh, I think that would be better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um right, well um what I did is with everything I start with the original um uh source material. Uh, so I took the example that um Jeremy had produced for doing um the CAMVID um, data processing. Uh that's actually quite nice because it, it it runs fairly quickly because it's got a nice small data set. Um what I was doing was applying it to the iMaterials fashion data set, which has got both, uh, it's I think 30,000 images. And so it's a, it's a significantly larger data set. Uh, so we've got our, uh, the only thing that I, I messed around with here, I think is a built in progress bar. Um, that was to allow um, me to, I don't actually think I ended up using it, but that was to allow me to show the, uh, progress to some of the longer things like um, doing the unzipping. So uh, we create our path. Um, we, here I've downloaded the iMaterialist data set and it shows you the files that are given to you. So you've got a test and a train uh, data set. You've got your labels folder, sample submission. So if you've um, seen Kaggle um, once before, this uh, all of this will, will seem fairly um, reasonable. Usually the sample submission CSV uh, showing you what format they want you to um, uh, present your results in. Um, your test and your train um, data set, usually in Kaggle, the train data set is the one that you're to use for your training and your validation. Um, the test data set is usually the data set that they are um, wanting you to run uh, your process on to produce your sample submission. The um, Test data set um, will not come with labels. Uh, so what we're doing is we create a folder for the mask images and we create a folder for the 
uh, models. And then uh, we take the input data and we know that we've got um, 27 apparel items um, because they, uh, the data tells us that in our labels um, JSON file. Um, so you can see here that what it's doing is it's identifying uh, things like shirts, blouses, tops, t-shirts, ruffles and sequins. <laughs> it's quite good fun. And then you need your um, function. Um, so this is the function that we're using to uh, define the what each of the encoded pixels is in our train.csv um, file. And it, create, it basically creates the image mask uh, this is, this will get fairly complicated. Um, if you're running, a, I've got a bit. This is the way I would do it. If you're running a, a, a Gaggle competition, um, have a look and see if anybody's already created a, a, an example notebook. Uh, quite often, the organisation um, that's running it will put a basic, um, uh, not competitive uh, pay, uh, uh, notebook up. And that will have the uh, the things like the processing of the data input in there for you, because uh, it's to be honest, fairly boring stuff to do, and it's I'd rather be doing the machine learning bit of it than uh, than defining how they've chosen to build their their data for for you to process, if you, if that makes any sense. So yeah, um, I have to admit, I stole this little chunk of code off of um, somebody else's, and uh, it was nice, because <laughs> I don't know if I would have been able to have written that myself. <laughs> so once you've done it, though, um, definitely um, rattle um, out and do a, an image.show to make sure that your data is um, coming through and getting processed well. You can see this um, is showing you a single image, and it's a picture of a nice person that what looks like a uh, opera or something like that. Looks pretty good. And then you should do the same for your image mask to make sure that that's coming in quite nicely. So um, I generally like to do it for the exact same image because um, then you can uh, you can sort of see if the mask is offset. And and you can see that this um, this does look like the the mask and the image tie up. It looks like the same thing. And it looks like everything's it's not mirrored or flipped or anything like that. So that's good. And then you create a, a free channel PMG um, and then open up uh, your masks. So you can see here that again, it, I'm just checking at each stage. This is something I would really encourage you to do. Um, you don't really want to. You don't want to um, start training your model and uh, realize that it's all going garbage and not, not then assume that there's something wrong with the way you're doing your training if um, if you haven't actually set up the inputs correctly. So make, make, take good use of the visualization functions uh, um, and at each step um, check that what you're doing is right. So next bit is to produce the masks. Um, so you generate, uh, oh, oh, sorry, um, yeah, you only, um, this actually takes quite a while and that's why the progress bar was in. Um, I, I only did this the one time um, and what it does is it's because it's creating, a, what you're doing is you're creating a PNG file that, match the information in the CSV. So when you've got those two, so what you'll have is effectively an input image and then another input image which contains the masking data. So when you're doing this the first time, you'll need to run this process to generate those images. Once you've generated those images, you don't have to do it um, the second time. Just leave them sitting persisted on your hard drive. You can see here what I'm doing is I'm just um, doing the usual data exploration, trying to see what the file names um, are, trying to see that I've got equivalent labels. And these are the PNGs that we've cr that we created during the mask production part. And then we 
define our lambda function. And because we've created the, uh, this simplifies things quite a lot, because we've created the, the output PNGs, um, we can make our lambda function um, just to tell it to look up the exact same file name, um, but with underscore P at the end of it. So you can show your input image, and then you can show your equivalent mask. You can see it's the same thing, all looks fine. We can define all our codes. Then we define what um, batch size we're using. So uh, you need a bit of wiggle room um, to do eight of these at, at one time. And you can see here what we've done is we've split the model um, size when we've halved it. So we're training on a half sized image. Uh, see, it's gone down to 112 by 112 pixels. And we've got a small batch size um, when this one ran. Oh, actually, I must have been running this on a K80 because uh, I've got batch size four, as you can see from the output. So you do your source and your data, um, same thing as before. Um, I showed you, it's, uh, you build your data bunch, um, you normalize it, your source. Um, again, we pass it the function, because this is um, how we're labeling it. And then we show a batch. And the good thing about having a show batch here is that um, you can see the images are being overlaid by their masks, and it does that all without any effort. Sorry, my voice needs to be hugged. There we go. Okay, you're hugged. Bye. <laughs> oh, I'll try. <laughs> and I've shown a second batch um, just to see if uh, uh, it. I don't know. I actually know why I did the second show batch. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I was checking the validation data set um, also looked good. As you can see, that's the difference there. Uh, I'm doing a show batch of the training data. And then I've said that I want to see the uh, validation data set the second time. Um, this one um, needed a different accuracy matrix. Um, the, generally, the, generally, the competition will tell you what it going to it's going to tell you what they're assessing you on and generally they'll also tell you how to write the mask um, in this case um, the I think what it was doing yeah it was excluding the background pixels so um, you see these unallocated pixels here in the background um, what they were wanting you to do is report your accuracy on the basis of only classifying the clothing um, pieces. So they only wanted the apparel um, to be um, correctly allocated. Everything else was meant to um, be allocated to, to zero. And this is one thing to remember as well is that your accuracy um, that you create, um, your accuracy metrics, they don't actually do anything different to the training. They're just ways of reporting information back to you. So I've defined um, weight decays here. I um, don't know why I've done that one, one, three, two, minus two. Uh, I think that's actually, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. I think that actually might be the default. I don't know why I've done that. It's the default. Yeah, yeah. I was maybe just confirming the default. <laughs> um, and then this is the, I know it all gets really complicated here, um, but we rather than creating a learner, you're creating a, unit underscore learner. You pass it the model that you want to base it on. Um, you pass your weight decay, um, and you pass it the model directory. Run LR find, plot the output. You can see here it's got a nice um, steep trajectory. So we would guess we'd probably want to do something about, uh, I would have said actually, I would have probably gone a bit before one three to the minus three. That is here. I wonder if maybe I didn't know how to read these graphs when I did this. Because <laughs> that's not actually a particularly good um, learning rate. You probably would. Something you're doing, like it could be four e yeah. minus five. Yeah, if I think I did this again. I I minus five to minus four. 
I would have probably minus gone four and a half, yeah, something like four minus four would be good. Yeah, that would have been a good starting point up at the top of the graph and let it slide down. I think I did one to the e to minus three because I didn't know any better. Yeah, and also when you do like learn dot render dot plot, so in that learn dot render dot plot, if you like suggestion equals to true, then it also gives you the value which you should put. Oh. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I didn't have that when I did this. <laughs> yeah, so you can put like suggestion equals to true, so it gives you a red dot in the graph, which it thinks you should use, but it's not very accurate, but it's still like uh, gives you a good indication. Ah, that's good. I'll definitely try that. So it's learn dot plot and dot suggestion. Okay, cool. And then you run your training. You can save and load it just like normal. And you've got show results. So um, this one, what it does is it shows you your ground truth versus your predictions, taking out your validation set, which is nice. Uh, it's, as I say, it's, it did. A, I thought it did a fairly decent job, um, but because uh, I'd already burned about an hour um, on training, and I'd um, burned quite a bit of other time um, getting the model to actually um, train, that's where I just gave up and stopped. Um, so I don't know. Um, I materials is still a that's still a, a competition you can submit results to. Um, I wonder, do we want to maybe take uh, my crappy? Uh, first attempt um, from over a year ago, and uh, for the week we could uh, try and improve it and uh, see if we can move move up the rankings and put in some better um, accuracy than 0.86. I still thought, to be honest, 0.86 um, uh, accuracy after a single epoch was was fairly good. Shall I kick off a VM and we'll, we'll have a go at it? Or? Yeah. Sorry? So I was asking, like, is just the accuracy which you are being tested on or some other metrics as well? Yeah, the, the um, generally, what, uh, well, it gives you your training and your validation loss. Um, but then um, what we're doing here is we're showing the um, the accuracy um, that the competition is going to be gauging us on. All right. Remember this, but the competition only cares about you correctly allocating the... Um, what, what was the accuracy for the, 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 the first 10? Uh, what, what was their accuracy at? Oh, I don't know. It would give us a ballpark for bar, bar figure how far you are from the... Uh, the top leaders. Leaderboard. I wonder if I've got my accuracy correct. The score is 0.89 and was definitely better than 0.32. I don't think it's accuracy. It's something else. It might not be. In overview, uh, you can see for what, what score they see are. See what they're checking? Ah, yeah, intersection over union, object segmentation with classification. I think they give a formula or something that uh, you put that at the end of your code and uh, that's how you get this number instead of uh, just the accuracy or something. It should be in their uh, overview. Mm -hmm. It's done fine grain classification. Yeah, they've gone evaluation, I guess. Yeah, and the evaluation part. No, order to just... I mean, I should try and let everything coding in the pixel values. Yeah, it um, all right, okay. Yeah, and this and this is part of the reason why the um 
the if you remember the um, the code to produce the um, the masks was um, quite complicated. Uh, that mm -hmm. it's because they've um, they've used this compression um, process on the uh, uh, the training data as well. Uh, it's just annoying. I did, I've, I've got. I, did, I, I would. I'd have rather just downloaded more data. Yeah, so those are seven. Yeah, it's a closed a year ago. So the good thing about these is the um, the closed ones is that you can see lots of public um, uh, notebooks. You can probably find some, for learning. Yeah. Yeah, there's probably some good. Yeah, so there's a fast AI factory report using mask images. Bet you that one doesn't look too different to the one I did. I like the way he's shopping bags also categorized. <laughs> oh no, it's his laptop case. Laptop case, yeah. yeah. Oof. He's got a lot of data time on it. Yeah. Let's see what they did. Oh mind you, he's getting um if you look at his accuracy fashion. Accuracy, yeah. Yeah, so he's getting nearly the same 68. as yours. Uh-huh. Much quicker, I he, though. I think probably what he's done is he's um, broken the data up and he's not processing the... He's put yeah. the learning learning rate at minus four. Probably if you put your learning rate at minus four or something, your accuracy might jump without any changes. If yeah. I'm not wrong. And also PCT start is 0 0.9. So it's actually allowing... Well, it doesn't make sense. Why it's 0 0.9? Because it's saying like for 10 epochs, first, so the first nine epoch, you should increase uh, the value of, of so like how how when we optimize this uh, this graph first goes up, then it goes down. Mm -hmm. so it's saying like just go up for ninety percent of the time, and it just jump down to ten. I've never seen this before. Usually, it's uh, once you have trained on like one minus four minus three for like three or four mm -hmm. epochs, people usually try to get rid of it. So it's default is point three. But you can just go 0 0.2, 0 0.1, or sometimes put zero, so that I don't want this to go up again. Otherwise, it will jump here and there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we saw the, when you see the normal graphs, um, it, it it sort of ramps up, um, and then about about a third to a half of the way through, then it starts yeah, annealing yeah. back down. So 0.3 by default, the PCT start value is 0.3. The so first 30 percent of the uh, training it goes up. And for rest, seventy percent it goes down. But it's saying like just go up for ninety percent of the time. The last ten percent go down. Yeah, that's a strange. Yeah, so I wonder why they have played with that. There'll, there'll be a, a reason for it. Yeah, should be something to try. I've never seen this before. The epoch, the, the rate he got through his epochs was a lot quicker as well. 18, 18 minutes at an epoch. Uh, I bet you. I bet you. This is me getting caught using standard uh, persistent disk again. Uh, I bet he was doing it on SSD. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you can see the, the output he's got um, isn't too different. The, in fact, I've, uh, admittedly, these are probably slightly more complicated ones than the, the examples I was showing. But it, it's not doing very well at. Uh, uh, allocating the skirt, it's made that like I think it, I think it's making the top a blouse. Uh, it's done well on on that dress, but not so well on this dress. Uh, it's interesting. Okay, um, well, do do we want to kick it off and uh, try running it, and we'll, we'll maybe make those corrections, and then I can leave it running, and we can see what the output is tomorrow. Sure. Yeah. I'll go on to. Won't do it on Kaggle. I'll do it on. Also, I, I, one thing I noticed, like there was no augmentation. Can't we augment data in some way which can help us? Yeah, well, they, um, this is the thing I was pointing out, though, is that if you augment the data on uh, on one of these kind of challenges, um, you, you have to augment your mask as well. So anything mm -hmm. you do to your, uh, your image will need to be, be done to the mask. So, let's see, I think it's, oh. I hate these kind of outputs. Let's see where he's what he's done. Okay. 
there's these data constructor. Because uh, I think that's maybe why they're, they're, they're not keen on doing uh, too much of the um, data augmentation is that if you think of if you're down and upscaling things, um, uh, uh, distorting the image like you would normally do, um, I, I'm not sure if that would work well on, on, a, um, on your mask image. You can maybe do things like scaling it, but uh, I'd be surprised. It's like if you if you start like slightly color shifting it, it's, it's pixel values, right? So if we are scale, uh, because oh no, that's right. Because when we augment, it's done randomly, so we can't actually track how it's augmented. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think I'm pretty sure that's probably why there's very little augmentation getting done. I think it still can be done. Because we can get the output from fast there, like what kind of augmentation it is doing on images and mm -hmm. what kind of augmentation was done on what images. Because when we do like show back, we get those augmented images back, right? And with the same numbers. So uh, if we know the image and we know the mask, I think we can transform the mask as well ago according to the augmentation done on the image and then use that. So we'll have more data to play with. Yeah, I think. I would be able to, but um, as, a, as, as we're seeing here, it uh, doesn't look like he's doing any any default transforms. Like the default is using get transforms, which are like default values. If he hasn't done any transforms. Yeah. He is doing transform, but like default values. Mm -hmm. He hasn't played any any with the like he hasn't put any transformation from his own side. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's only uh, the only constraint he's put on it is the uh, transform y. Okay, right. Um, I'm just trying to think. But actually, well, should we just do it in Kaggle? I've uh, I've got my my, my um, thirty hours of GPU back again. <laughs> I'm just saying, if we do it, um, if we were doing it on, um, we need to recreate those masks, and the process of doing that takes about thirty to forty minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think I think if we were gonna if we we're gonna actually have a go of this, uh, it would have been probably better to um, uh, to prep the the data and things like that. Um, but when I was asking it on like we can Slack, go to the and see what, what if someone has any idea, you just write that and comment it out, and you can try it later. Yeah, sure, that would work. Yeah. So we're accelerating our GPU. So we'll just skip through all the boring stuff at the beginning, all the hygiene stuff. Ah, so the only I think yeah, I've got a sneaking suspicion the way that he managed to do this so quickly is he only took five thousand images. If we scroll up here, yeah. Just the five thousand images, which is probably enough to get you going. But that—that's that'll be why his epochs were so much quicker. What's the, what's the total number of images? I'm trying to remember. Let's go back to the materialist. Jump to the data. It, we should be able to just see it from the data. Yeah, so Ooh, that's a lot of images. Yeah, it was forty-eight thousand images. Yeah, so that's why that's why my epochs were running slow, and that's also why the um, process of doing the extraction and creating the, the masks um, took so bloody long. Mm. It took you fifty-one minutes. Uh, 
if I'm not uh, wrong. Yeah, 51 minutes for, for one. an epoch. And he did nine or ten epochs. So what do you think is better doing, uh, taking a, a, a smaller number of images and doing lots of epochs or uh, doing the one or two images or one, uh, one, two, one or two epochs on the whole, whole day? Yeah. Well, I get that they did transformation and uh, which I keep saying because they implement dropout um, and weight decay, uh, your mm. your risk of overfitting is fairly low, um, uh, especially over doing something like um, 12 epochs. You're, you, you really aren't going to get much overfitting and it will stay fairly generalized. So I suppose that's probably why that person's made the... the um, I, I think the advantage of having the larger data set um, is that you probably would generalize more and you you yeah. i mean you would de-risk overfitting by having a much larger data set you won't need to um, uh, augment to anything or else uh, so you, the masks and everything you don't need to change them on the uh, original data set if you just take the whole thing yeah especially if you're only running one epoch <laughs> yeah <laughs> you only let the model see the data yeah. once <laughs> yeah I think that that's why his uh, images. If you look at looked at his images, uh, some of the dresses were fine, but the others were not fine. I mean, they were not properly segmenting them. I think mm. because he's got a, a smaller number of images, that's why. Yeah. And yeah, uh, the one you ran, it was on the full uh, data set. That's why yours images were better. I think. Yeah, and I think that's the thing is that if they. Uh, his one, unfortunately, might not. There might not have been any big long um, ball gowns in the in the data set, so it, it would find it more confusing. Whereas, because I've got the much larger distribution of data, yeah. it, it, it pretty much anything that's in the validation set you would expect to be in the um, the data set that's in the um, in the test set. There'll, there'll be an instance similar to it because um, otherwise uh, you, you're training for the wrong problem. Uh, yeah. And this is maybe another fault in the approach that this guy's used is that he's just taken the first 5,000 um, images. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's not take. I don't think he took a random uh, 5,000. He should have taken a random one. But even if you take a random one and you've got 48,000 images and you just take a set of 5,000, it's, it's uh, not going to be uh, a proper general uh, uh, learning. Yeah, you do have to worry about it though. Is you've got you've got to remember a lot of these um, data sets get produced um, uh, using sort of human processes, um, and they, it might have been a case that they um, they took uh, the J C Penny catalog um, photographs as their first five thousand. Um, yeah. So it. it, it <laughs> Although across the board, it'll have um, Asian fashions, um, ball gown weekly um, images in, uh, later on. Mm -hmm. uh, the first mm -hmm. 5,000 might all be JCPenney stuff or it might be yeah. all Marks and Spencer stuff. Yeah. And it, it, your, 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 your model gets really good at uh, identifying those images, just not so good at the Specific rest of them. images, yeah. Uh, I think it's a matter of uh, managing your time. If you've got a huge data set, if you want to take the whole thing or... Uh, it just occurred to me what if you uh, I don't know if it's possible uh, if you've got 48,000 images if, if you just split them in half and do an epoch on one and then uh, train another uh, the same thing on a, a second the second images and see if there is any difference in that mm -hmm. uh, but one of the approaches I quite like is um, is cross validation so it, what that's doing is it's um, rotate it takes your validation set and it rotates it out uh, they, okay, I, I think, uh, to be honest, I don't think this is going to be much fun for us to watch. We're only 15% uh, of the way through um, generating, yeah. <laughs> generating masks. Even with his, yeah, even with the 5,000, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and as you can see, it's, uh, it, it, it's these anemic machines they give us with uh, two virtual CPUs <laughs> sitting, mm. sitting, sitting burning uh, at CPU time. Uh, so again, uh, one of the things I always yeah, suggest is if, if you're doing something like that, turn your GPU off, but because of the stupid way Kaggle works, um, you can't do that because if you need your GPU later on, um, it, you, you need to have it on for the session. Yeah, at the start, yeah. Uh, I guess what you could do, um, if, you, if you were repeating this project um, uh, in Kaggle, um, what I would suggest you would do is, um, 
generate your mask images and um, then download them and build a, a new data set and then use that using the add data and what you can do is you can generate uh, that you can use that as an additional data set um, that you can input into your um, VM that way that will be one of the ways of persisting it um, even if it, even if you, it's a case you need to download the data onto your own machine and uh, and generate the masks and then and then upload them to Kaggle because uh, uh, you you don't want to be burning um, you don't want to be burning significant amounts of GPU time given you've only got a thirty hour limit uh, whether your GPU is just not getting utilized mm. yeah, I guess that's the you start to have to think quite sensibly about conserving resources. Oh. All right, well, uh, uh, this has done an hour. Um, should, we, um, should we call it a day just now? And um, yep. what, what we'll do is I'll, um, I'll run um, this on a, a I'll, I'll generate the masks on a, and, and build it as a Kaggle data set. Um, and then we can, uh, we can try. Um, we can we can try playing around with the actual models and the training, um, rather than watch it processing uh, and generating a bunch of PNGs. Yeah. Sure. Also, I, I looked at the data size. I think I will be able to run it in my Polar Pro. The size of the data is just under what I can run. It's like twenty one GB. So the earlier one which I had was like twenty five GB, and that was zip. So. Uh, but this one doesn't look like zip. So 21 GB. I think I think I can play with this during this week as well. Yeah, that'd be cool. I, I, yeah. I would be interested if uh, Vishal, you told us how much time and everything it took uh, into comparison because I was also looking to get a. Uh, uh, I don't think it would take much different because on Kaggle we get the same kind of GPUs. Uh, I think we get, uh, if I'm not wrong, P100s mm -hmm. or Tesla. Uh, one of those, so time will be kind of same. Uh, the GPUs are same, both on Kaggle. And wasn't wasn't uh, Collapse Pro supposed to be uh, optimized? I mean, they gave you uh, the best of all resources, and it and does, stuff like but, that. but the best is still, <laughs> still, quite still not good enough. Yeah, generally, you get K80s, but if you get Collapse Pro, then you get P100. So there is a significant difference because mm -hmm. K80 is like 8 GB RAM, you go from 8 GB to 16 GB, like double yeah. of it. The session is from 12 hours to 24 hours, and also your RAM is from 12 GB to 24 GB. So everything is doubled, but still it's... Still you can get the, better... What was the uh, thing, but the phone is quite similar. Yeah. I think it's uh, Cola Pro is for people who've got larger data sets, if, if what you're telling me is right, then... No, it's, it's for everyone. You get more resources, but not fast speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a limit to the um, when you get the VM. There's like a space limit, so you only get like 70 to 80 GB of space on your VM. So you can only mm -hmm. utilize. It. You can't. It's not like a AWS or GCS where you can add more storage. So you have a limitation yeah. of this because it's again from a pool which they are giving you, but you're giving mm -hmm. they are they're giving you on priority. That's it. Apart from it, there's no difference. Between I think for ten dollars, that's a good deal. Yeah, it is. That's why I took it because there's no limit like thirty hours like on Kaggle. That after yeah. thirty hours, if you go off, uh, I can just keep on Leave running on. for the whole week without. And ten dollars is it, like, Isn't there a limit on how long you can run it? Because uh, there's a session. I think for lab has gotten eight hours. hours. But I think you can save your pickle files or PTH files and then. Start the session again and continue where okay. you left, so it's not a problem. And you have to access but, it via VPN then. If well, yeah, US. because it's kind of illegal. So <laughs> 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 because it's only available in state, it's it's not available in UK. So you can use it through that. And and someone has to give a UK it's a US card detail. Okay. Okay. Oh, cool. All right. Um, well, what is, I'm gonna um, I'll stop um, sharing uh, so we can see all our faces again, and then I'm going to stop recording.